Okay, and stop, 60 seconds. So now what I'd like you to do is I would like you to just, it takes you a little longer, it takes you 60, 60 seconds to write those things. It's gonna take you 10 or 15 seconds to just read through them again. I'd like you to just briefly read through those five or 10 qualities that that person described to you and just reread them very quickly. I'll give you about five seconds, how they describe you. And with a high five to the screen, how many people feel better after they've written that, seen that, and read that list? Any high fives to the screen after that? Excellent. James, good job. <laughs> <laughs> so that is an idea of what gratitude can do for you because it's talking about what your strengths are. Why are we so hard on ourselves? I've never understood it. I had somebody come up at one of my talks and live and he says, how can you tell, how, how come you don't ask people to describe their shortcomings? I said, what do you think this is? The negative Nelly hour? I said, holy oh cow, this is about gratitude. We're talking about what you can focus on. We tend to beat ourselves up sometimes. And so how somebody else sees you and they see you and every one of you raised your high five shows that focusing on what you have, in this case, gratitude, your strengths, the things that make you who you are, can put you in a better frame of mind. It makes such a big difference. I know for years, I know that none of you, I don't think have ever met me before. I've known Scott Wetzel for many, many years. And I will tell you, no matter what somebody told you about me, oh, he's pretty confident or he's this, or he was a store manager, or he was whatever he did. He was a pilot. I was a hydroplane champion, uh, driving hydroplanes and all this other stuff. I had many, many days still do in my life where I just thought, what is going on? I'd look in the mirror and what's going on with that person? And I used to call myself a word that I will never say to myself again, because your self-talk is so important to what your ears hear. And I won't say the word, but I will spell it for you. And I would call myself an L-O-S-E-R. And I thought, man, if you don't advocate for yourself, who's going to advocate for you? So if you're calling yourself names like that, and here you have your biggest cheerleader that calls you and, and looks at you and sees you in this great light, why do we beat ourselves up? I'm not really sure, but I'll tell you the self-talk thing is so incredible. Gratitude and a gratitude journal has been absolutely critical in and helping keeping that focus on the positives, on those strengths, and don't worry about the, the weaknesses or the opportunities and so forth. But that's just part of the power of harnessing gratitude. It just makes such a big difference. And you know, in with all this coronavirus COVID-19 thing going on, I don't know if it's as true as, as it maybe is normally, but I know it's been proven over and over again, two people go into a hospital with the same disease, the positive attitude lives, the negative attitude dies. So that's how powerful it can be. It can literally save your life. So quick around the room, Nancy, and it looks like three ladies and a gentleman, and or any of the guys on the screen, what has been the best coping mechanism? Pick one to get through this coronavirus. How about Nancy? How about your group? Just go around the room. What's been your best coping mechanism for dealing with this? Exercise. Exercise. Active. Exercise is a great one. Working on the house. <laughs> house. Another good one. Anybody else? Humor. Humor. That's a great one. That's a great one too. Cool. I'm with Tori on exercise, but I will also throw in alcohol. Let's <laughs> 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 <I> be <feel> real. <laughs> High five to the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those when I when I do senior centers or the average age is about 90 and I'll go find the oldest person I can hand, I can find and I'll say, you know, you're 90. What do you know at 90? You'd like to know at 18 and half of them say everything in moderation. So I guess maybe alcohol would be one of those things that would fall yeah. into it's it's good but as long as it's in moderation. James, yeah. how about you? Oh, oh your I'm mic's off. You're muted. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um I like to listen to music and uh, I'm kind of one of those people that likes to lay low. So mm -hmm. I don't have to be doing a whole lot to have a good time. Oh, cool. <laughs> cool. You know, just hanging out with my wife, having a cocktail, listening to music. <laughs> That's fantastic. Stuff like that. That's fantastic. Nathan? Hang out with the cats. Yeah, good. Uh, the, best thing, the best thing for us has been extra family time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's really true. And I think a lot of with the schools and things like that where – They'd say, well, we don't get to go to school, but that'll be time that you'll remember for the rest of your life that you got to spend with family you may not have uh, prior to this. Kevin, how about you? Yeah, the, the family time has definitely been a huge blessing. Yeah, cool. 
And I think it's, it's again, particularly pertinent because of what we've gone through this year. But I wrote down kind of some of the silver linings of COVID-19 because everybody would say, well, how can you be positive? People are dying. How can you have a good attitude? How can you be grateful if people are dying and suffering and, and so on? And I thought, well, it's true. But again, we've got to look to see the positive. Life is really interesting. We're born, we have a life, and then we die. It, de it definitely has kind of an end point, which isn't the most positive thing. So what are we going to do in between that, those two dates on that tombstone? They say the dash is your life. And so to me, how you present yourself and my attitude is I just like to see it from the positive side, the glass half full. And so there'll always be those other people. But think about some of this stuff. Zoom, everybody talks about Zoom getting Zoomed out and all that kind of thing. Zoom wouldn't have even been available five or six years ago because not so much of Zoom, but because of the bandwidth that they, it takes to get the videos and stuff going. Um, the whole thing with the family, Nathan just mentioned that, all this extra time, family dinner kind of made a comeback. I grew up in Spokane for about 15 years. I remember having family dinner on the South Hill. We lived off of Rockwood Boulevard and it was great. All seven of us always having dinner every night. That went away. Whoever thought a vaccine would be turned around this quickly, they were saying that the typical vaccine going back to polio and all those things was two and three years. And here it was in literally six months to a year. And I think how you look at, you tend to look at your whole life a little bit differently because it gives you a different kind of perspective. And these efficiencies, I would drive an hour to meet a friend at Starbucks and then have a cup of coffee for an hour and an hour back. Now we do a Zoom call and I've got two extra hours I never had before. So that's made a difference. And then of course, all this delivery thing, I haven't been into a grocery store in, I don't know, six or seven months and knock, knock on the door and there's Amazon Fresh and so forth. And I think one of the things about gratitude is it really helps you to realign your priorities because when things, when you're at home and like James was saying in, in time with the wife or the cats or whatever, you kind of realign your priorities and you kind of really start to see what has been maybe the best thing in your life that you have that you didn't think about before because you were too, you know, tied up your thoughts and everything else. So uh, one thing I will suggest, this is not so much a homework, but I think it's a, a great idea is to consider doing, I heard exercise a couple of times, is to consider doing a daily gratitude walk. I do at least 12 to 15,000 steps every day and I video it and I send it out and so forth. But I think that it's neat to get out there and get the exercise and then focus on two or three things that you're grateful for for that day. And it can be the same things, but it's just nice. The combination of exercise and gratitude, the fresh air and everything is really, really nice. So something to keep in mind. Now I wanna tell you a little bit about the science of gratitude. A lot of people kind of kid me and they go, well, this is kind of a woo woo thing. And is this sort of uh, you know, new age or whatever. And I said, well, you know, you can think what you want, but I'm going to tell you some of the things. I have a couple of little study comments that were made here. I'm going to read this kind of fast, but this has been proven through studies and research. So what I'm talking about is not just some, uh, again, woo-woo kind of thing. It says, appreciating what we have measurably improves our relationships, our life satisfaction, our health, our sleep, and it improves our physical health, leading to fewer aches and pains, lower blood pressure, and lower depre and less depression. Grateful people are more likely to take care of their health, exercise more often, and schedule regular checkups. Gratitude reduces toxic emotions like envy, resentment, frustration, anger, and aggression, and enhances positive emotions like empathy, caring, and sympathy. Too much of our time is spent pursuing things we currently don't have. Gratitude reverses that and, and realigns our priorities to appreciate what we currently have. Happiness is rarely constant. So although happiness is a fantastic goal, gratitude for the tools that get you there are more important. How easily we can lose sight of everything we have to be thankful for when the circumstances of life become unpleasant. And that's certainly been true this last year. We are our own worst critics, I mentioned that earlier, and we hold ourselves to impossible standards and we continually compare ourselves to others. Science says that the more you choose positive and kind words to describe yourself, think of that exercise we just did, your health, your body, and your progress, the less anxiety you will experience. And lastly, a recent study concluded that people that wrote in a gratitude journal participated in significantly less gossip and other toxic behaviors in the workplace. People who feel good about themselves in their lives are kinder to others. And one of the things that gratitude will really do for you will make you have a better impression of yourself. And so very, very important. Several of these exercises we do today, you saw the first one a bit ago, are designed 
to continually build that relationship with the person you see in the mirror. I contend it's the most important relationship you'll ever have. And I understand that people with faith and I'm a Christian and God and Jesus and everything, but I'm just talking, it's, it's the one or two most important relationship is that person you see shaven, brushing your teeth, brushing your hair, whatever it might be. So, all right, next exercise, go back to the pad of paper. And I'm going to give you 60 seconds for this one. And it's going to seem like it's a little bit of a bigger exercise, but I want you just to do as much as you can in 60 seconds. And as many things as you can write down, I want you to write down as best you can recall and try to put it in priority order, the top five or 10 or 15 most memorable events of your life. The biggest events, it can be trips, it can be kids, it can be family, it can be school, it can be anything. Whatever are the most memorable events of your life, right? As many as you can, possibly in, in uh, priority order as well. 60 seconds, go. Okay, and stop. And as I mentioned, that's a, um, a little bit bigger exercise, but here's what I'd like to do. They say when somebody says, will you do me a favor or will you do something for me? If you're a so-so friend, you say, what is it? And if you're a good friend, they say, sure. So I'm going to ask you guys, all give me a high five to promise me you'll do something with this list. Can I get a high five from everybody before you even know what it is? Everybody high five. Great. Thank you very much. January 5th, one week from today, I would like you to promise me that you will do this. You will expand that list out to one of three things, top 25, top 50, or top 100. One of those three, expand it out there, put it on an Excel spreadsheet, put it on a Word doc, something that you can make it easy and you can shift it around. And then you can print it up afterwards and you can keep it on your desktop. You can keep it on a piece of paper. You can put it on your mirror, your computer, the kitchen, uh, the refrigerator in the kitchen or whatever. Doing a list like that will keep you so focused on many of your blessings. And if you're having a bad day or you're down or depressed or blue or whatever it might be, you look at that list, you will feel better. And how I kind of came upon this is I was thinking one day and I've done a lot of things and, and, been on the planet seven decades now. So you think at least I've been around for a while, quite a while to do a lot of things. And I was lamenting all the things I hadn't done. I hadn't been to Paris and I hadn't been to Italy and I hadn't been to just, you know, this part in, over to see India or whatever it was. And I started thinking, what are you doing? Why are you going down that road? Why don't you start thinking about all these things you did? So I put together a list and I would, that's why I said from now, between now and next Tuesday, January 5th, if you promise me, you'll do that. And again, it can be 25, 50, or 100. But when that list gets done, and I prioritize, I did a top 100. And when I got done with that, and I keep it on my computer desktop, and I keep a piece of paper with the papers I'm kind of working on, it'll totally change your viewpoint. And you'll start seeing everything that you have done versus the things you have not done. Hence, again, gratitude, because we're talking so much about focusing on what you have versus what you don't have. It's just amazing to me, this comparing ourselves to others is like a cat chasing its tail. It's never going to catch the tail, and yet it goes round and round and round, and it's kind of silly. So really focusing on what you have is so important. And I understand, especially in, it doesn't matter the size of group I'm talking to, there's always going to be some, some sort of bell curve, the people that really get it, the people that don't get it, and then the people in the middle that sort of on average get it like a typical bell curve. And that's fine. But I'm just saying these are opportunities that people have to do things that can keep your focus in the right place. And that's so really, really important. So, okay, next thing we're going to jump into is the gratitude journal. So grab the gratitude journal. This is kind of the centerpiece to everything that I talk about. 
I bring it up kind of early because I want you to um, kind of be thinking about it throughout the rest of the talk. So there's a number of things in here. Hopefully you wrote in the second or third page or the second page, your name and phone number and email. I, these last about three or four months. And so I have been doing this for 10 years. So I probably have 40 of them or something like that. But I lost one once and it really bothered me. And so I added a little thing that said, your name and phone number and email. So make sure that's in there too. And so the format and it, there's instruction on it too, but we're going to go over just briefly this format right here. When you turn to the first page, and I'm going to have you write on it today. So if you've already written in it, great. If not, we'll start with the first page. So on the first page you turn to where it says gratitude today, go ahead and write in the Tuesday, December 29th, uh, 2020, and we'll save the daily number for a second. And then Current events and special occasion, I'll have you write in in a second. That's something like I have on mine, medication review uh, talk I'm doing today and so forth. And then you're going to have what you're grateful for. And there's the highlight of the day. And then the gratitude tomorrow. I'm not going to have you write this today, but we'll talk about it in a second. So, so here's the first thing I want you to do. Once you've filled in uh, Tuesday, December 29th, uh, 2020, and... Any current events or special occasions, again, you can write in that now or later, but that's fine. But the first thing I want you to think about is this daily number. And the daily number is really a way of kind of taking your temperature. And I say one to 10 is the scale I use. 10 is the best day of your life. And one is one of the toughest days of your life. And this is something that's very personal. So I never, I do exercises where people share things with the person they're sitting next to and so forth, but this is just for you. So nobody's going to know what this number is. Whatever that number is, write that. That's how you're feeling at this exact moment at exactly 11 o'clock on Tuesday, December 29th. Write that number where it says daily number and put a circle around. It could be halves also. You can do seven and a half, nine and a half. You might be having a tough day, four and a half, whatever it might be. Go ahead and write that number and put a circle around it right where it says daily number. And then what I'm going to do is I, I've timed this a lot of times. It takes me about five minutes to write in the gratitude journal. But what I want you to do, I'm going to give you about two minutes uh, to just kind of conserve time here. So what I'd like you to do after you put that daily number in there is you can write the current events or special occasions, just, you know, again, medication review, talk from the gratitude guy or whatever, what's going on in your day. But then I want you to take about two minutes and where it says, I'm so grateful for it. You can do one of two or three things. You can write full sentences. I always write complete sentences. That's just the way I do it. Uh, it just makes different. It just makes, I'm so grateful for this. And I'm, I'm thinking about this and so forth. Or you can put bullet points. You can put my husband, my kids, you know, the job I have, or you can do bullet points. Uh, you can make little shorter sentences and type things, whatever works for you. I'm so grateful for. And then at the bottom, I want you to write where it says the highlight of my day. What was the highlight of your day yesterday? Probably not today is only 11 o'clock. So probably yesterday, Think back for a moment when you get down there and think, what was the highlight of your day yesterday? The best thing that happened to you yesterday. So I'll give you two minutes to go ahead and get that knocked out. So go ahead and start.
Okay, and that was two minutes. And as I said, normally uh, everybody writes at a different speed and so forth. And I, I've timed mine many times and I write pretty fast and uh, I'm used to doing this obviously for a number of years, but I, it generally takes me about five minutes. And uh, I'll say like less than eight minute abs or some of these other things that people advertise. It's not much time to really keep your brain sort of fine tuned and focus on what you're grateful for. So, so now, now I'm going to do something a little bit different. Just want to see how this works. So you look at what you wrote for the current events. If you wrote something there, then you wrote what you're grateful for. And then hopefully you wrote down your high, highlight of the day yesterday, the best thing that you had happen to you yesterday. So as you just briefly reread the things you're grateful for, in the highlight of your day, I want you to write another uh, daily number at the bottom. It could be the same number or it could have changed, but write that at the bottom and put a circle around it at the very bottom of the page. And so with a thumbs up to the screen from the number at the top to the number at the bottom, how many people's number went up? One, two, three, four, five, six. Excellent. Looks like about six out of eight or so. That's the impact that something like that'll have. And you think about in a two minute exercise when you're focusing on what you have. And I will tell you on the front of this, I've had people say, well, don't you have an app? And, you know, I have a thing and I, I talk into my phone and all this kind of thing. In the upper left hand corner, you can see that little saying it's really small. It says, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. And they've proven that the, the typing on the screen and all these different things that are on the keyboard, rather, you know, all that stuff is fine, but there's nothing quite like, I am so grateful to Nancy Huddle. Are you listening, Nancy? Just making sure you're listening. For inviting me to medication review. It plants it in your brain. And there's just a better, much better connection. And it'll sit there and it'll stay there, which is really what you want to do. So it's really important. And another thing too, depending on the type of person, you know, people, they say people are so different, but really another thing is I've opened this up from what I wrote at three in the morning when I couldn't sleep really well and reread what I wrote and it got me back to sleep or that little thing about them that you had that was, you wrote that the biggest cheerleader would have. When I'm in person, I have people put that on a three by five card. If you feel like it, you can do that, put it on a three by five card. Whoops, name's on the front there. And that's another thing at three in the morning or if you're having a bad day or something happened, that'll help you because all these exercises are just designed to bolster your mental picture, your self-esteem, your whole picture of how you see things. And, you know, there's good and bad days. This is life goes like that. It's like the ultimate roller coaster. And the high things are great. The low things suck. Everybody wants to be high again, but it's the low things when you really learn the lessons. That's when you really get the best out of it. So it really makes a big difference. And I will tell you on the right-hand side, just to give a brief comment on this, gratitude tomorrow what that is, is that is writing and you don't have to, you can start small and just write a few things. And if you get more and more time, as I said, I write every day and I fill out both pages fully because I believe in it. The gratitude intentions is what is on the right side of the page, AKA gratitude tomorrow. And that's where you write what you're grateful for that hasn't even happened yet. And so it's, I use the example of the 10,000 soldiers. There was a time that I would write on the right hand side, I'm so grateful to be speaking to 100 people when I started out about uh, eight or 10 years ago. And then all of a sudden there's 50 people. And so and then pretty soon it was 100. Then I wrote, well, I'm grateful I'm speaking to 500 people. Then I spoke to 500 people and it kept getting bigger and bigger. And then at one point I said 10,000 and I spoke to the 10,000 soldiers and then a million. And I had a video that got a million views, the million people had seen it. So it plants it in your brain, anything to be grateful for before it's even happened because your subconscious mind cannot distinguish between what is actually thinks has happened and what's actually gonna happen. And so it's just a way to sort of program and plan and, and give yourself some positive things going forward. It just makes a really, really big difference. So, so grab your cell phones. And take this number down, if you will. This is my phone. I want you to text me something. The number is 206-371-8309. 206-371-8309. And I just want you to text me, what's the number one thing you're grateful for? It'd be a person, a thing, or anything, but I kind of love to pull the audience and see how people are thinking. 206-371-8309. 206-371-8309. 
206-371-8309. Number one thing you're grateful for. Okay, thank you for doing that. So a couple more things before I leave the gratitude journal. I had a, a, a lot of challenges growing up, and don't we all? I mean, I think that I, I've never really been one of these people that stops and says, oh, yeah, I had it worse than the other, even though my, my folks, uh, again, had died when I was young and my wife passed away and these other things that had happened. I believe, you know, we're given what we can handle. And, you know, sometimes the stronger you are, the more you're given that. I believe a lot of that. But but I had something happen to me when I was um, uh, about 16, 17. My mom used to always call me and she would threaten suicide if I didn't come over and see her. And she would take her little pills, her sleeping pills. This is back in, we'd moved to Seattle by then. And she'd put her pills right by the phone and she'd go like that. And she'd go, you either come over and see me or I'm gonna, I'm, you, I won't be here in a couple hours if you're not here within an hour. And I just thought it was the worst thing. Just, as I mentioned, I have two children and to be a parent, there's five of us to do that to somebody and shake these pills. And, and I, what am I supposed to do? So I'd go over and see her and she'd be depressed and all. I try to help her as best I could. And, but then she later passed away of uh, cancer. And, but I think I got some of her depression. And so I learned to manage it on my own without doing something like that to my sons or anything else. But exercise, you heard that mentioned as a coping mechanism, exercise and water and keeping my weight in control and eating the best food and getting good sleep and hanging out with positive people. And a lot of those really good sort of daily rituals that we can all go through, they really helped me. But once in a while, it rears its ugly head. And I woke up one day, I had to talk up in Burlington, North, uh, Burlington, Northern, Burlington, Washington, about 100 miles north of here. And I woke up and I was at two. So you can appreciate what that means because you just wrote the numbers for yourself. And I was just not feeling good. And so I thought, well, Mr. Gratitude Guy, you better practice what you preach. So I went to Starbucks and I wrote in my gratitude journal and everything I was grateful for. And it helped. It brought me up to maybe a four or five, but I was still having a really tough day, maybe a six. And so I went up and I did the talk. And after the talk, I'm selling books and people are coming up to the table. And um, this gal says to me, she's kind of got tears in her eyes. And she says, you just changed my life. And I said, really, what did I, what did I say? She goes, well, I don't want to get into one of the stories you've talked about and some other stuff, but I will just tell you, it really changed my life. And I just really appreciate it. Can I give you a hug? And she gives me a hug and she buys a couple of gratitude journals for her sons and for herself. And so I, I packed up and I was done and it's always very re rewarding after a talk like this or a presentation in person or whatever. And I walked out to the car and I got in the car and I just sat there as I was about ready to start up the car and I realized I was now a nine. And I went from a two to a four to a five writing in the gratitude journal to changing somebody's life to making me feel like a nine, maybe even nine and a half. And I didn't do any drugs. I didn't smoke any crack or all this other stuff people do. All these people that do these things, it's all about trying to help them cope. I'm not a, somebody who's very judgmental around this, but drugs and prescription. My wife died of a prescription pill overdose. She got hooked on Vicodin and Oxycontin and took too many and died. And people are just trying to cope. So I'm not critical of them. I'm just saying that a gratitude journal and focusing on what you have is such a good way to do something for you that's a coping mechanism that's healthy. And you heard those, those coping mechanisms earlier, exercise and working in the garden and um, humor and so forth. And it's so important, but those are all healthy things. And so a lot of people choose unhealthy coping mechanisms. And then unfortunately, in a lot of cases, they're not around later. And, but it was funny too, because this, this one kid, he just listened to my talk and he comes up, and I'm selling journals. And he says, is this your own, your person, you this yourself? I said, well, of course I write my own way. So can I look at it? So he, he takes it and he looks at it. Well, don't look at it too closely, but he just kind of thumbs through it like anybody would in a book. And he goes, wow, you write in this every day. And I go, did you like listen to the talk? Were you like even listening to anything I said? No, I just write in occasionally. You, I want you to write in every day. Me, I just do it occasionally. If it's going to make you feel good every day, I mean, it's already set up here. It's all ready to roll for tomorrow. Here's the camera. It says Wednesday, 1230, 2020. And with my little picture of my son that's my bookmark 
but it's just ready because it makes that much different. If something makes that much of a difference, it's so important. I have these fraternity brothers I've known for years and they would always call me and it says on the front of it, you'll see it says the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. And that was my nickname. And then I kind of became that gratitude guy from there. And so they call me, I need a dose of the Brooker. I need, a, I need some inspiration, I need some motivation. I need things like that. And I go, oh, gosh. So I used to help them and now, in the last 10 or 12 years, whatever it's been, I said, they call me, I need a dose of the Brooker. I said, have you written your gratitude journal? And they said, they go, no, I just hang up on them. I just hit the off button. <laughs> and they just go like, and then oh, sure enough. So I just watch it just for a couple of seconds. And three seconds later, ring, ring, Brooker. I think we got cut off. They go, no, we didn't. I hung up on you. I said, go get a gratitude journal. Don't you have one of mine and write in it. It'll help you. The whole thing is that I tell people workshops, talks, in-person coaching. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I do group coaching, all those things. I will be your training wheels, but I'm not going to pedal your bike. You have to do some things yourself. You know, it's like, I think the good Lord gives us a toolbox and then we can build our own house. You know, it just, you don't just get it presented to you. So this gratitude journal is so important. I've almost kind of gotten militant about it. When people tell me, if you've, well, you've written in a gratitude journal, if you've exercised today, if you've been drinking a lot of water, eating healthy food, hanging out with positive friends, getting your sleep, meditating, stretching, exercise, you've done all those things and you're still having a tough day, I will talk to you. I will be happy to help you because, but you've got to be responsible for doing some of your own things. And I just think it's so important. So I will tell you, it's, it go, I'm going to come back for a little bit on this finding yourself and this relationship you have with yourself. So I call this find yourself find your talent, find your passion and find your purpose. And you just, you just can't give up. I mean, I started speaking when I was 62 years old, that was eight years ago. And now I'm 70. It's like, it's just, I mean, who cares? Colonel Sanders was 63 when you started KFC. What difference does it make? But that relationship you have with yourself is so important. And the better relationship you have with yourself, everything in your life works better when you have it. And if anybody's interested in this, I'm not going to read it because I don't want to have that much time, but I have something called 12 ways to increase your self-esteem and, and self-confidence. If you would like me to send you a copy of this, just write to me. It's David at that gratitude guy is my email. Easy to remember David at that gratitude guy, and I'll send it to you. But it's just, it's interesting because if I use the same thing, I use the daily number as an example, to kind of measure how you feel about the person in the mirror. But I could also say your self-confidence, and you have to answer that honestly. 10 is the best and one is the worst. Well, if you're a four or five in your self-confidence, you're not feeling good about yourself. You just, you know, things aren't going the same way. You're carrying too much weight. You haven't been working hard enough. You know, you whatever, whatever the example is that gets you. If you raise your self-esteem self to an eight, nine, or 10, everything in your life works better. Your confidence improves, your attention to detail, all those different things will all improve. And that relationship, as I say, has so much to do with how you see yourself. And, and the better you see yourself, the better. Connor, my youngest son, was, was four years old when Dana passed away. And he tried and tried and tried to play baseball. And he had a horrible time. He had to be held back in kindergarten, if you can believe that, held back in first grade. He's now 26 and doing phenomenal, thankfully. But back then he had the worst time because he was so young when Dana passed away. My older son was 14. And, but he would go to the baseball thing and he, he just couldn't play. He tried. He couldn't hit, couldn't throw, couldn't catch, couldn't run. Other than that, he wasn't too bad. But uh, what else is there? And so we're, he's playing like t-ball and there's coach pitch and then there's t-ball and he's trying so hard and on the t-ball he would swing the bat way up by my head where it is and i go no you want to hit the ball i go connor lower and he kept lowering it lowering it, and he finally hits the t and the ball falls off and goes forward about three inches and he goes dad i got a hit and i went connor that's not how this game is played is you got to hit the ball you don't hit the t but he goes on for about six or seven years never plays, goes out little league, all that kind of stuff. And finally we come to this May 31st, I think it was 94, whatever it was, he was about 10 or 11 years old. And finally there's this opportunity, they're playing some other team, it's the bottom of the seventh, there's two out, he's never played. And there's two people on base, they're up, it's the last ups and they're behind seven to six, two guys on base, two outs, nobody left. The coach calls down to the dugout, who else is left? He needs another batter. And the guy goes, there's only Brooke is down here. So he says, send him out. So Connor comes out with a bat and he's like 
swinging like he's Ken Griffey Jr. or something. He's never even played. And so I'm in the stands as I had been for all those day games. And he gets up to bat. And again, he's acting like he's a big hitter. And I'm just going, I'm in the stands going like, how about a bunt? You know, just anything. If you can just do that, I'd really appreciate it. And, and so ball one, strike one, ball two, full count, three balls, two strikes. The next pitch comes in. He rips it down the third base line, just inside the bag. The guy from third comes in to score. The guy from second rounds third. And he's heading towards home plate. Here comes the ball. And the ball is coming in. The catcher catches it. The guy gets to home plate. They all crash together. They fall on the ground. The ball pops out. And so they win the game eight to seven. And he's standing out on second base, just like this, all by himself out on, on second base. And I hear this from second base, dad, I got a hit yeah. and all by himself. And then the whole group comes out, puts him on the shoulders and carries him off to the back to the dugout, the game winning hit. He'd never even played. And so it's all about this idea about if you just don't give up and you keep trying, there's a million stories out there, but it's so, so really important. And a couple of a couple of questions too to ask yourself. You can write these down if you want, but I think it's really important back to this relationship with yourself. What makes you feel really happy is a great question to ask yourself and think about that personally or professionally. You know, what makes you feel really happy? Because a lot of times people they they drive for all sorts of, of awards and goals, but then they're not really happy. So what makes you happy? What zaps your energy is another good one. What are the things that maybe that's some of the things you shouldn't be done? And then thirdly, how would you describe your passion? It's so important. I tell people, I put on my computer a lot of times, it says slow down and it says smile because I get going so fast and I just am very passionate about this subject. But what would your passion be? It's something that's very important. We'll talk about a little bit more in a second. And then if you're happy and you don't get activities that zap your energy and you describe your passion, what could you do that aligns with those three things? What's something that would help you be happy, not zap your energy and describe your passion? I mean, I feel blessed that I get to do this work that I get to do, so it's so important. And then something else that I came up with recently, which I think was kind of cool is, what action would you take if you knew it would double your potential? So what would you do for yourself, if you knew it would double your po potential. And again, that's personally or professionally. So just some things. And by the way, if you have any, any um, of these, I've gone by too fast. I'll put some things in the chat too, that um, I'm going to put some links in there as well. Um, but back to yourself. I think it's so important. This relationship you have with yourself is so critically important. I was down in Reno with a buddy of mine years ago when the slot machine still had the quarters and, you know, he, I, we're just playing slot machines, having fun down there, going to some shows and stuff. And I look over and I hear all this screaming and he put in 50 cents, two quarters, and he won a thousand dollars in quarters. So they're cascading down and they're just ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, like that. And he's going like this. And I, I walk over, he goes, Brooker, I won. I got, I got a thousand dollars. It cost me 50 cents. And he says, I'm buying dinner tonight. And I went, God, that's great. Now, as I was standing there watching the quarters go down, I was thinking, I'm so happy for my friend. I'm so happy. But then it occurred to me, I'd be just a teeny bit happier if it was me that won the $1,000. And that's just being truthful. Now, a lot of you, oh, you should never admit somebody. Well, I, I just know I'd be, I mean, I was happy for him, but it'd be, that's why that relationship is so critical. You've all heard the thing about put the air mask on you first and put it on your child, make a strong foundation. You can't have a building if it doesn't have a strong foundation, that's you. And after that, it kind of depends on, again, how you look at yourself and it's such a personal relationship it makes such a difference it's just you as i say and the person in the mirror and only you can change it that's why i did that example of the biggest cheerleader when i'm in person i have people pair up and take a card like this and write what's your name nathan i'm david nice to meet you and then we each write how we see the other person you are in just by just introducing yourselves it's amazing how people will see you and they've only met you for 10 seconds the look you have the eye contact the handshake the fist bump i guess now the shoulder bump whatever it might be and people say to me, oh, I'm going to keep that card forever. So that comes back to that thing of how you see yourself. And if your biggest cheerleader can bump up your mood like that, just imagine. But at the same time, remember, it's so important. Here's a $20 bill. This has got Andrew Jackson on the front of it. Now, if I was able to reach through here and hand this to anybody, I would think most people would take it. 
Thank you, Kevin. That was good. I'm trying to get it through to Kevin there. San Francisco Grown Rich. So let me ask you this then. So if I did this, would everybody still take it? Yeah. Thumbs up, whatever. Okay. If I put it on the ground and stomped on it like that and then smoothed it out and got it all straightened out again, would everybody still take it? Yes, you would. And then if I looked at Andrew Jackson, I said, hey, Andrew Jackson, you're a piece of crap. You're worthless. Uh, you're a loser. I don't know what you're even doing on this planet, frankly. You know what he would do? Andrew Jackson would look back at me and he'd say, well, you know what, Mr. Speaker man? You can say what you want about me, whatever you want to say about me, but I'm still worth 20 bucks. <laughs> and he would be right. So then my question is to you, any of you, no matter what size audience I talk about, I can talk to you individually. Why do you let somebody crush you? Why do you let somebody step on you? Why do you tell somebody that lets you say you're full of crap or you don't belong on this earth or any of this kind of thing? And maybe the worst thing of all, devalue you from 20 to 15 to 10 to five to the worst of all, zero, and let them get away with it. And- I'm not a sexist person. I just speak to everybody, but I will tell you sometimes that resonates more with women than men. Although I had many men tell me, I like that $20 bill deal. I can't believe how some people allow somebody to treat somebody else and let them get away with it. Well, guess what is one of the best antidotes for that? One of the best vaccines, if you want, is focusing on gratitude. Because when you focus on gratitude and all those blessings that you have and all the abundance you have, that relationship with yourself, that self-esteem, you will not allow somebody to treat you that way. It just doesn't happen. And I'll tell you, but it's so important though. Find yourself. Next, find your talent. You know, if you're five foot three, and you're 150 pounds, you're probably not going to be an NFL quarterback. You know, figure out what your talent is and, and work towards that. Make your strengths productive. Make your weaknesses irrelevant. Let me just say that again. Make your strengths productive. Make your weaknesses irrelevant. Don't worry about the weaknesses. Don't worry about the things that you don't have control over. Make the, make the strengths productive. Make them. When I was at Hutton grade school on the South Hill of Spokane, Washington, of all places, and there was music tryouts. And so they had a little card. I was in sixth grade, so I was 12 years old, 1962. You can do the math. I mentioned I was 70. So I had a little card, David Brooke, what's your first instrument? And I put drums. I wanted to be a drummer all my life. And it says, what's your second choice? I don't want a second choice. I just want to play drums. You had to put it down. So I put down trombone. Then I fell out David Brooke, 917 East 20th, Spokane, Washington, all the rest of the kind of stuff. So I wait in line with my little card. And so finally comes up to me and he gets my hand him his card and he goes, hi, young man. He says, oh, you want to play drums? And I said, yeah. So he goes like this. He takes like a pencil. And this, is, this is like 40 or 50 or 60 years ago, whatever. I remember it like yesterday. And he taps and he goes like this. Now do that. And I said, okay. And I kind of did the same thing that he did. He goes, great. Trombone for this boy. Send him over here. <laughs> that was it. Didn't get to play drums. You know, and I was thinking, apparently it wasn't my talent, you know, so it's just one of those things that if you think about that, find yourself, have a great relationship with yourself, find your talent, figure out what makes a fit for you. Next, passion. We talked about that a little bit earlier. If you're curious about what your passion, when it said here, how do you describe your passion or what would you describe your, your passion about? If you're not sure, that's fine, but think about some things in your life. What did you want to be when you grew up? What would you do if you didn't get paid for? What was, what was one of those things that you thought, I always wanted to do this, but just never had the, the strength or whatever to do. And if it was like another one that's a great one is if you had a million dollars in your checking account every day, you couldn't possibly spend it. What would you do? It can kind of tell you in some ways what you can do and why you want to do it because it's a passion. Because I speak for clearly the oldest one here. Life has gone by very fast and it moves by fast. And that's why even for me starting late, I said to people, don't ever give up. I don't care how old you are. I go, I go from junior high schools to senior centers. So 15, 16 years old to 90, 95, everybody in between. But if you're my age, I don't care. All these people, Colonel Sanders, I mentioned earlier, John Hausman, the actor was 71, I think when he started acting and then he got his first uh, Academy Award or something at 72. But it's so important. So then once you find that passion, now you got to find your purpose. And even on the passion thing, it's sometimes it takes a long time. It was 
it was in 1962 or 1962, 19, uh, 2012 rather, eight years ago when I was managing the Lowe's and I decided it's time for me to stop talking about being a speaker. So I'm 62. I don't care. You want to do this, you're going to get into this. I'd done all this stuff I mentioned before on the work with Scott and at uh, Nordstrom and the different things and had a lot of success, but I always wanted to be a speaker. So who cares if it's too late? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It just, we just finally do something to finally make that pack. So I finally decided I was going to do that and I quit Lowe's. Then I come home on the December 26, 2012, I think it was. And Connor is 17 at the time and he's sitting on the couch. He says, what are you doing home? And I said, um, well, I quit. He goes, you quit Lowe's? And I went, um, yeah. He goes, you quit being a store manager? And I went, yeah. He goes, well, what are you going to do now? I said, well, I'm going to be a speaker. And he just thinks about it for a second. He looks up from the couch and he goes, well, that's just super dad. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I wasn't quite sure. I kind of goes, I have a question for you. Uh, what are we going to do for food? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you know, we'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. But it's really important. The passion thing, I can't tell you how strongly I feel about find yourself, find your talent, find your passion, and find your purpose. And I think once you do those in a great relationship with yourself, find out what that is, get the talent, have the passion and the purpose. But even on the passion thing, a buddy of mine, I was having lunch with him one day and he wrote on his uh, little piece of paper, David George Brook, $1 million, Michael Hartzell. And he gets it and he says, and he had a lot of money. I don't know if he had a million dollars, but anyway, but he hands me the check and he goes, would you take this? And I said, well, of course you go. Oh, wait a second. There's just one, one uh, qualification here. I'll give this to you if you stop being the gratitude guy right now. And it took me about five seconds and I went, no, thanks. And he went, you found your passion then. So clearly it wasn't going to be a million dollars. It was going to get me from going for away from this because it's just so, so important. So, um, those four things together, plus that the backdrop of gratitude can make such a big difference. So, but here's another thing I want to mention too. And this is something else. I want you to write this down for me that you will promise me you'll do another little homework. If you want to help yourself, help others, because we all need to help ourselves. There's a lot of people that are up front and be, you know, behind us and uh, in front of us and behind us in the race of life on that race. I had all those people in front of me and all the people behind me and so forth. And so we're somewhere in the continuum. But what I'd like you to do is if you want to help yourself, help other people, it's been proven. Rotary, I do a lot of talks with Rotary, service above self. It makes such a big difference. If you're looking to get a better mindset, you start helping other people and you don't concentrate on yourself. And what are some of the things you can do? You can do a food bank, a homeless shelter, a church, whatever it might be. So assignment, and I'm not going to follow up on this. I'll just, hopefully you'll give me a high five as I just want you to all write down one to three names of people you promise me you'll reach out to in the next week to help. And you can reach out by a phone call, an email, a text, or a note, and just say, so-and-so, I'd love to help you. If anything I can help you with, just reach out to those three people. It'll make such a difference in your day. You pick the three, you can pick one person, you can pick two or three, whatever it does. It doesn't matter. It's okay. But just promise me you'll do that. Can I get a thumbs up on that from everybody? Such a great group, Miss Huddle. I got to tell you, very responsive. All right. So what I want to talk about a little bit now is this sort of communicating and interacting with gratitude. And one of the things when I worked at Nordstrom and did all the, got the promotions, I got eight promotions in 15 years and so forth. The number one thing that I took, and whether it's the size of a medication review or a Nordstrom or a Boeing or whatever, the number one rule that I followed is one you've heard many times, and that's the golden rule. And the actual, one of the definitions of the golden rule was, the golden rule is the ethical principle of treating other people as oneself would prefer to be treated. And so I don't understand why people struggle with that so much. And understanding that you just treat somebody the way you want to be treated, whether you're their boss or they're, you're their you know, person underneath them or above them or whatever, if you do that, and even in this day and age, now we're remotely, and so we're going from Zoom calls to maybe not as much together, but wherever we are together, one of the things that I noticed in the, the time that I had at Nordstrom is so important about how you ask something, how you ask somebody to do something. And one of the things that I noticed is that I would start out and I just wrote down a couple of them. Would you do me a favor? It was one of my favorite things to start with. And it would mean a lot to me if you would do this or whatever it was. Uh, would you have a moment? Could you take care of this? And I just 
would you mind, would you please? Always with courtesy and even when you're the big mucky muck, it doesn't matter. People will follow you anywhere if you treat them uh, just super well. And I just never understood how hard that was for people to grasp that concept. I remember, and then, and then there's four things you should never do though. I just said you should. Four things, you, you, it's just not a good plan. Is start any sentence with you should, you have to, you gotta, or you need to. Those four things are just kind of demeaning in some ways. And people don't listen to you. And I will offer you, instead of you should, you have to, you gotta, or you need to. Those are four you don't want to use. I'll tell you one you can use in, in place of that is the word consider. Ask somebody if they would consider X, Y, Z. It's just such a better way. And it comes across with such a better way to, to um, chat with people and to get your point across. And there was some, it was amazing to me because as a store, as a Nordstrom store manager, the biggest complaint I got surprisingly enough was that people that worked in my departments were rude to the um, employees or to the customers. And they weren't even this, they, they said that they acted like they were like the most special person around. And I never got over that because I thought, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm technically the biggest, uh, most, the highest person on the organization chart here. And I don't act that way. So it was really surprisingly, but, but it was interesting. A lot of Nordstrom's experience was from hiring two policies or using two policies, hiring, hiring the nicest people you could find and then teach them to give really good customer service. And they didn't say anything about education or training or all these types of things. It was just, you know, get really, really nice people and then teach them how to give customer service. But I guess the question is, is how fast do you think you can change behavior? So let's go around the room again. And that you, I've heard things, but I'm curious what you guys think. How fast do you think you can change a behavior that you have? So Nance, how about your group? So some people from there, what do you think how fast you can change a behavior? Um, I'm still working on behaviors. <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas, any thoughts? I've always heard six weeks to make something a habit. Or oh, read. Like 21 days. Yep. I've heard that too, six weeks, 21 days. Yep, I've heard 30. Nathan, how about you? Yeah, I was I was uh, thinking right along with Jeanette that you know, 30 to 60 days to make something a habit rather than an action. Yeah, yeah, I agree. James or Kevin, any other thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I feel like in, it kind of depends on the situation, but in my experience, it's even longer than that. And, mm. you know, sometimes you have to fundamentally change somebody's belief about something and that can, you know, I, <clears throat> I guess my, my first thought was, you know, six months to a year in some cases. Yeah. So it just, so you can see that's all the way across the board. And so, uh, and it's been proved a lot of science behind that too, about somebody changing the behavior. So I have a story and an example of one where I think it, it comes up with a little bit different answer is that when I was, when you work at Nordstrom, you start at the bottom and you work your way up the way a lot of companies do it. And I was, had been moved to store or department manager of the suit department at Northgate. And I was, I was very aggressive and very motivated and so forth. And so I was winning all these contests and they'd have a board where you come in in the morning every day. So which were the top departments yesterday for a percentage of increase over last year. And it was always me and I won contests and all this. And so one day I'm in the lunchroom and uh, I'm just, you know, kind of to myself in my little briefcase. And, and this guy named Steve comes up to me. He's a guy that was worked in maintenance. And he says, um, aren't you Dave Brook, the suit manager? I go, yeah. He goes, can I, uh, can I tell you what everybody thinks of you in the store? <laughs> I went, um, sure. Yeah, sure. Whatever. I mean, that's good. And he goes, well, everybody thinks you think you're hot stuff because you win all the contests. You don't talk to anybody. You walk around here with your little briefcase, your little shiny shoes and your little like perfectly <laughs> tie, you know, and you just think that you're just all that in a bag of chips and you don't even talk or look at anybody because you're too cool. And I'm just like, whoa, I'm just like taken back and I go, really? And so I let it sink in for a little bit. And then I realized that uh, the guy made a good point and I stuck my hand out back when we were shaking hands and shook his hand. I said, Steve, I want to thank you for having the guts to tell me that I really needed that. And so I said, thanks again. And I walked out the lunchroom, closed the door. And I thought, this is how fast 
That's how fast I think you can change behavior. I think you can snap your fingers and change. I thought you were going to do a 180, my friend. And I went back to my department and I walked down the escalators used to kind of crisscross. I'm saying hi to everybody. Everybody's going to hi, what's going on? How's your department? How's Brass Plum? What's going on in Lady Shoes? And became Mr. Friendly and did a total turnaround because I decided I can't have that reputation. So there's a case where depending on your level of motivation, how fast you can change behavior if you really have a big enough why. And I didn't want to be thought of as some smart ass. And I think, and somebody who thought he was cool or whatever, and I'm not even, I didn't realize I was doing it. I was so busy and so focused on my business. You know, the escalator doesn't go any faster when you say hi or any slower, you know, it's still moving at the same speed. And so it really changed it. And I think that was really responsible for getting a lot of those promotions because at Nordstrom, whether people are know it or not, you never apply for a job. They just pick you. And it was a very strange, I'd worked in other big companies before, but they just pick you and they go, they go, you're going to be our person. That's going to be the new manager of this or the manager of that or whatever. So, but it's really, it, it really left an impact on me and, and so forth. So another thing I wanted to mention too, is I want to mention how employees have changed for the last 30 years from 30 years ago to now in terms of what employees want 30 years ago, surveys would tell you the number three thing that people wanted in a job was being in on the no Having the, having the inside track of knowing what's happening. Number two is help with personal problems, even though it would be not related necessarily to work, just having somebody help them. And number one was appreciation and recognition. And just even if that recognition is meaning that you're going to just say hi to that person and recognize them and tell them good job or whatever it might be, that was it. But now it's changed. And so now in, the, in 2020 and 2019, uh, things have shifted a little bit because of these new generations and so forth. And Number three is responsibilities. People want responsibilities and to be held, you know, to, to know that they're being charged with doing certain things and so forth. And number two, you've heard this a lot, is goals. People want goals. And that's, and then this appreciation and recognition was still sort of woven in there. But the big thing that is now number one, and I mentioned this word a bit ago, but I think it's so important, and that's purpose. People want purpose. And they want to know that what they're doing has a purpose to it. And it's one of the reasons why you get people that leave jobs and go work for Wikipedia and different places and just do this research and different things for free because they, um, it just gives them a purpose, which they think is something that's so important. It's, I really admire. So anyway, okay. So another exercise. So go back to your pad of paper and I think about how things change us when we do things in life. So what I want you to write down at the top or wherever you have a space you're going to write a few things underneath it is never happened to me those are the four words right never happened to me and then i'm going to give you back to the world famous 60 seconds again where's my clock thing here it is and in 60 seconds I want you to write as many as you can. It depends on how fast you're writing, how many things you can think of. I want you to take 60 seconds and write down all the bad things that never happened to you. And it might be something like, I've never been assaulted. I've never gone hungry. I've never been homeless. I want you to think as many things, really bad things that have never happened to you. 60 seconds, go. Okay, and stop. And this one, you don't necessarily have to put on a card or you can just refer to it or you can combine some of these together on a Word doc if you want, whatever works for you. But 
I realized how important it was. And on, on the surface, it sounds like, wait a minute, what do you mean never happened to me? What, all these bad things. What kind of exercise is that, Mr. Gratitude Guy? Well, when you think about the things that have happened to people that haven't happened to you, it's another way of showing your brain how grateful you are. I was thinking when I first put this exercise together, I started thinking, man, I've never been homeless. I've never lived in my car. I've never been assaulted. I've never been uh, mugged. And I started thinking of all these things that never happened to me. And once again, it's another way from a different angle to approach your brain to show how many things you have to be grateful for because you had all the stuff that didn't happen to you. And I'll see some program about people going off to jail and it'll be, you know, they, they, kill somebody or something that says life without possibility of parole. And I thought, Oh my God, what would that be like? You go, you know, you don't even get paroled. You're just in this prison for the rest of your life or whatever it might be. But when you reread that list and look at it, it'll really, you'll feel a lot better. I mean, it's just another one of those things. And you can use all of these or none of these or combine them or whatever, put them all on one piece of paper, whatever works for you, um, whichever you'd like, but they all have that same effect of really impacting you a lot. So uh, another thing I wanted to talk about, and this is one you might want to write down, it's up to you, but I just think it's so important to have a system. And as I say, whether it's a system of the things I've covered today and exercises or whatever, but to also set goals and get your sleep. And there's these sort of top 10 rituals that I think about every day that are sort of an important thing to do. But this is what I might want you to write down because I love this. I found this somewhere along the line. A dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. And lastly, a plan with action makes your dream come true. A plan with action makes your dream come true. So that just shows you how when you break it down into bite-sized pieces, there was that famous thing about how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time and so forth, uh, which I know is true. But there's something about that. You, you got to start with having a plan. So a dream is, is a date and a goal. That You know, it's got the dream is here. It's written down with a date. So there's actually a time that's going to actually happen December 29th, whatever it might be. And then the goal, you break it down into steps that you're needing to do becomes the plan. And then the plan with action taken on those steps makes your dream come true. I think a lot of people want to have their dream come true too. So, um, so I got to figure out how to do this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about just a couple of quick things on remembering names. Uh, I just think it's so important to remember names. So, Who's the first person that can yell out to me the six words I gave you? Kevin? Leaf, igloo, soda, tree, eyeball, net. Good job. Nancy Huddle? Leaf, igloo, I'm there, I'm there, hold on. <laughs> Leaf, igloo, soda, tree, eyeball, net. Got it. I knew you guys would all get it. That's why I was hoping you'd be individual in all your Zooms. Uh, will you... Uh, send that coffee cup to Kevin. You bet. So Kevin gets the gratitude guy coffee cup and you're going, wow, I knew this was worth it today. <laughs> but I will tell you there's um, something that's so important. And in, in this, I think this applies anywhere in personal or professional life, but this idea of remembering names, I will tell you, I tell people I'm generally very good to names. I don't forget names. I make a point of it. And so listen to the self-talk when they go, yeah, you're so good with names. I'm terrible with names. And I go, well, you know what? You keep saying that, you'll always be terrible with names because that goes back to I'm an L-O-S-E-R. You keep saying that these two things, we'll hear what this one thing said and it'll convince you every single day that you're an L-O-S-E-R. So the things, and some of this has changed because of all the Zoom type things and so forth. But the two ways that I use this the most to remember was number one, you may have heard these before, but I always think it's another remind, a great reminder is number one, uh, use the name immediately when somebody introduces you. And I, this is Kevin Walker. Oh, hey, Kevin, how are you? So Kevin, how do you know Nathan? Oh, we work together at medication. Oh, really? Okay. And Kevin, do you, and so you say it two or three times. So you plug it in. And the second, so that's half the battle. And then the second one is, is to use name association. 
and associate it because I'll sometimes not remember, but I'll get the name association. And the key to this one is it's the first name that comes to mind. Don't ask me how weird it is or why it is or anything. But if I met Kevin Walker and Kevin, nice to meet you. The first Kevin will come to mind would be Kevin Durant. I don't know why, but that's just, that's the first thing that hits me. And um, it's just one of those things. And it, between those two, 90% of the time you'll get it. And then of course, Nancy, who has what I would call somewhat of an unusual spelling on her last name, told me that it was huddle. So of course that was easy because now I could see it as phonetically H-U-D-D-L-E and yet it's H-U-E-T-T-L and it just plants it in your brain. So those are some good things to, to keep in mind in terms about listening or remembering names rather. And one of the things I'm gonna wrap up on a couple more things, about five more minutes is when it comes to listening, there's a couple of things I feel very strongly about with listening. Um, try not to talk about yourself. It's, it's one of the things that just blows my mind how many people, I, I get this happen all the time when you're with somebody, Kevin and I are talking and then another friend comes over and, and we go, Kevin's telling me, he says, what's, what's happening? I'm asking how you're doing. And then this other friend, Joe, comes over. What's going on? And Kevin says to me, well, I was just telling Dave, I just got back from Hawaii. You know what happens nine times out of 10? This guy, Joe, we just went to Hawaii. We were, in fact, we were in Hawaii like six months ago. In fact, we went surfing and we went to all these other really cool places where the suffering. And I go, we're not talking about you, okay? We were talking about Kevin. Why, do we, why are we all of a sudden talking about you? So it's so important. And I'm actually, again, kind of militant about it. I tell people, look, you can, he, Joe can get this thing, but let him finish. Let Kevin finish and tell about his whole trip. And then when that's done, you can say, well, that's ironic because I went to Hawaii and we did some things and that so forth. But people just so are so anxious to insert themselves into the front of the conversation. And I will tell you two, you can write these ones down too. Two, three word phrases that will have you getting more friends that you can imagine you could have, that one person could have. The first comment, the first three word phrase is, tell me more. You don't start talking about what you're doing and how you went to Hawaii. I work for medication review. Your company's no good. I'm really doing great. We're this, I know Scott Wetzel. You know, it's all this. Just tell me more. People will keep going and they will think you're the greatest person they ever met. Well, so we went to Hawaii. Well, tell me more. Well, then we went surfing and we went to the smaller islands. We did this. We had two really great barbecues and one of those roasted pig things. Well, tell me more. Well, then we went to a luau and it was just, they'll just keep going. They'll think you're the greatest person they ever met. I'm telling you, it works every single time because so many people are so anxious to talk about moi, you know, and the second three word one, very similar to tell me more is, and then what? So they're telling you something. So I got a raise and I was really happy and everything's well, and then what? Well, then he told me he's going to give me a bonus on this and that. And that. Well, and then what? Well, we went and we're going to now actually have a dinner where they're going to celebrate all this because people don't do it. So uh, it's just, it's so interesting to me how many people want to insert themselves. It's just cracks me up. And so anyway, okay. Um, I've got a couple more things I want to cover. The five, <laughs> the five regrets of the dying I think is really cool because it tells people that the other end of their life, these are all people that are in their nineties, what they were thinking. And I'd mentioned earlier about making your strengths productive and make your weaknesses irrelevant, everything in moderation. It's so really important. But I thought these five comments that the surveys they did of all these people that were 90 plus were really instructive for any of us, regardless of what all the different ages are here about how people were looking back on their life from a 90 or 95 year old perspective. Number one, and some of you may have heard this before, but I think it's really powerful. Uh, number one, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. So if you want to go down a path to the left, but your family and friends and everybody who thinks that they're your close buddies or whatever wants you to go down to the right, consider going down to the left because it's, it's the path for you. And people also, well, we, I thought I, my, my father and grandfather is a huge, huge, whatever huge is, law firm in Spokane called... Uh, Hamlin, Gilbert, and Brooke way back then. And then it was, I don't know, it changed. But they wanted me to be an attorney. And I didn't want to be an attorney. And it was in like the Washington Trust building or something. And my dad was always disappointed in that. But I just, I didn't want to. I didn't want to be an attorney. I had other things I wanted to do. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I think that one is really key because so many people, I'm too busy. I've always got this. I've got too many things to do. And they work hard. And all of a sudden, they're 60 or 70 or 80. And they un unfortunately maybe haven't had as much time to have a work-life balance. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. That's another good one. 
I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. I think that's been something that's been a bonus maybe out of the coronavirus thing with the Zoom. And I do a lot of Zoom with friends and my family and different things that maybe we didn't get together as often. It was kind of cool. Uh, and the last one, which I kind of touched on today a little bit, I wish I'd let myself be happier. I think a lot of people are they're searching for money and power and fame and all this kind of stuff. And it's uh, it's really what I think they really want to be happy is maybe kind of the main thing that somebody wants. So, uh, and I noticed that when Robin Williams and Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain and, Bourdain and Chris Cornell and all these people take their lives, my father took his life. And I was thinking that, you know, in those ca cases of all those famous people, it looks like you know, power and fame and fortune and money and celebrity wasn't enough for them. So, you know, it's just one of those things. So, okay, grab your cell phones. And what I want to do is I send out, Nancy, I don't know if you may have already gotten this, but every Monday I send out a Monday morning minute. It's a one minute video on gratitude. Goes out, went out yesterday morning. Yesterday's was on forgiveness. And so if you'd like to get that, here's what I'd like you to do is go to your text and just put in the number in the text 42828. 42828 is the number. And then in the message, just put in gratitude guy. 42828 is the number. And in the message, all just all one word on gratitude guy. Just type it just straight across gratitude guy. And that'll that'll give you it'll ask for your email and so forth. And so and so you all got your gratitude journals and I encourage people to do those as much as they can. Even if you start out, you all have them thanks to medication review and thank you, Nancy. And so it's so important to give it a try. You have them and you can try them. And I write, I don't miss a day, but I'm also the gratitude guy. But if you even start out at the very least, you're gonna have your other list done, your top 25 or 50 or 100 by a week from today. Maybe by between now and January 5th, you try writing it every day and see how it makes you feel. And if it, if it doesn't impact you and you say, well, I don't know what that guy's talking about, that's fine. But at least give it a try. I think it'll make such a big difference. So, uh, okay. The last couple of things is sharing gratitude. After we go through all this and you see how you see yourself and helping other people, I'm going to reach out to one or two people to see what I can do for them to help yourself, other people, help other people. One of the things that's really cool to do is share things with other people. And I mentioned the Monday morning minute, you guys have that, then the gratitude journal you already have. Um, there's, I do have a YouTube channel. I have a lot of subscribers on there too, is another thing. But I want you to get your smartphones out and share some gratitude. So everybody grab your smartphones. And it just something about sharing just makes it more, more the experience just that much better. So in your smartphone, I'll give you 60 seconds. Now, most people are going to text. I call this the four T's, text, tweet, telephone, or tell are the four, four T's. But most people will text. I'll give you 60 seconds, and I want you to text somebody in your life, whoever it is, your choice, and tell them how grateful you are to have them in your life and use the word grateful. And just text them and let them know how grateful you have in your life. And please use the word grateful. 60 seconds, go. Okay, and if you want to do more. <laughs> If you want to do more, you certainly can. Uh, I will tell you that um, I try to gauge it. The, the junior highs, they do about six texts in like 30 seconds. I've never seen fingers move so fast. And then in the senior centers, it's like, uh, can you help me? And we're kind of doing one character at a time. So it's kind of uh, takes a little longer. But it does make me laugh, though, because when I'm in person, 
they come up to my book table and they want to show me, you know, the message and stuff. And so people come up and they go, look at my, look at my message. And here's one that the guy showed me and it says, uh, after he texts whoever, and it says, I'm grateful for you too. What do you want? <laughs> wow. That was nice. It's supposed to be a nice thing. What are you talking about? Another one he shows me that says, are you sure you sent this to the right person? <laughs> hey Dave, I, uh, I shot it to Wetzel. And Leslie goes, you must be with Dave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, I'll tell you. When we have more time, I'll tell you what I think of Scott Wesley. He's one of my favorite people. Just a tremendous guy. Uh, and then, then when I was in, in, in doing it in person, there was a lady that was using the phone. And she was down kind of in a performing arts center. So the seats went way up like this. At a, and she was about 15 feet away from me. I was on the stage. So she was calling on the phone. I could hear her from where I was standing behind the podium. And she goes you know, yes, honey, I wanted to call you and tell you, everybody else is texting. I wanted to call you and tell you, I'm assuming her husband. Yes. And I'm just, I'm so grateful, so grateful for you. And I just um, love you. And I just appreciate you. And I'm just so grateful. I don't know. Some speaker just told me to call you and tell you. <laughs> God, no, don't say that. It's supposed to be your idea. It's not my idea. It's going to shoot the whole thing. So my biggest thing is that, um, actually, let me do one more quick thing. Biggest takeaway, if you could only pick one thing, Nancy and your group over there, what, each one of you, what was your biggest takeaway from today? Mindset, yeah. That you can change in a second. Oh, good, excellent. Mindfulness, your view of yourself, yeah. Yeah, so, so important, so important. Yep. Yeah, James? I think uh, writing down all the things that that didn't happen to me really mm. puts in, I don't know, I think that's a big um, component of gratitude. Yeah, that's it's a, something that's I've good. done in the past and I think it's it's overlooked by a lot yeah. of people. Yeah, excellent point, thank you. Kevin? I think the comment you made about how much more powerful actually physically writing something down is than typing or verbalizing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they've, they've proven that too, that it's not just, as I say, with the woo-woo too. So that, thank you, Kevin. Nathan? Um, I think uh, the thing for me was that you can always find a highlight um, of your day. Mm. Yeah, and then good. And thank you all. Those are all excellent points. And I really appreciate the feedback because to me, it just reminds me of so much where different people, you know, they say different strokes, different folks. I just try to find enough variety of things to get the cross, get the point across about um, gratitude, and even um, as James was saying, the from the not using, I only started that recently because I it hit me one day, and I thought, look at all these bad things that have never happened to me. Gosh, how fortunate am I, and stuff. And so, anyway, so anything that helps you get it through. But my last plea would be just to thanks to medication review and thanks for them getting the journals and so forth is just to just give it a try and. I don't expect somebody to be as fanatical about me. Maybe they are, but I just, I don't think I've missed a day in 10 years. Or I think once I missed a day and I went back and rewrote it from pretending it was the day before or whatever. And um, it's just, it's just made such a difference in my life and it's changed me and it's, it's helped me to help other people. But the biggest thing it's done is give people a healthy coping mechanism and a world of so many unhealthy coping mechanisms, but gratitude can do the trick. It really can. So Thank you all very much. You, exactly. 1201. I'm one minute. You I'm one minute over. Oh my gosh. So any questions, by the way? I don't usually get a lot of questions, but any last minute questions? Um, are we gonna ask them? Yeah. Okay, go. The 42828, it came back with a Zen gratuity. Oh, then so it was it should be it maybe if you do 42828 in the number and then where the number is, and then gratitude guy, it should be all one word. It actually has a Space. Yeah, it's got yeah. a space in it. But when you when you do it as two words, it comes back and it says, please send your email address in order to join Zen Rabbit's gratuitous, gratuities community. Interesting. Okay. I, thank just, you. I texted it to you so you can see what it is. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good, you guys. All right. Well, Nancy, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And any other questions, please email me, David, at that gratitude guy, if you have anything that you want to know later on. But I appreciate your attentiveness and your responsiveness and all that kind of good stuff. So, see, it's like 90 minutes. And it seemed like it was only a half hour. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Bye everybody. Happy new year.